I remember as if it were yesterday of the old, broken, despair voice of André Malraux on the French radio on the day of October 1971. There were, of course, a lot of news in the French television about what was happening in this country, in, the, in this part of Pakistan, in this side. There was a few news at the bottom of the newspapers, at the end of the news on TV. There was some news about the fact that in what was called at this time Eastern Pakistan, there was a sort of civil war impossible to decipher between two groups having probably equal responsibilities. This is what we more or less had in mind. Not we, but the people who were watching the TV. And suddenly arrived this voice of André Malraux saying that it was not a civil war, but a war against civilians of this part of the world, which said that there was not an equally shared responsibilities between two parties, but that there was a brutal attack and slaughter by a powerful and dictatorial army against a people who was just starting in self-defense to arm itself. And this old, legendary, and broken voice launched an appeal, an appeal to the universal conscience, consciousness, an appeal to the world, and an appeal for brotherhood, solidarity, and commitment. He just said, this old writer, André Malraux, he just said the following. Forty years ago, in the depth of darkness, in the worst of, at the beginning of the worst hell which humanity knew, which was the civil war in Spain, I, André Malraux, organized a civil brigade constituted of international volunteers, and we went to fight in Spain. And he said, we won, the Spain was the beginning of a long story, which was the attack of the fascist regime of Italy, of Germany, the Nazis, and others against democracy. It was a hard fight, who did cost millions of dead, but the democracy prevailed. And we Democrats thought that democracy had prevailed forever. And we democracy, said André Malraux, thought that this would, will never happen again. Plus jamais ça, never again. And the old voice said, alas, unfortunately, we were wrong. It is happening again. What was supposed not to happen again is restarting in a very remote place of which we French had heard very little, which was the then East Pakistan, and André Malraux, National Brigade of Volunteers. He made this public call. Bangladesh of today deserves uh, the international consciousness gave to Spain of yesterday. International Brigade has to read it. And a few Frenchmen, or not, even, not only French, a few nationalities, came to see him ex of my um, uh, high school in France, called the Colombal Superior. I just has fi had finished my course of philosophy, and I went to André Malraux 
and I told him, I'm on board. I'm with you. I'm your man. I came to Calcutta. And it happened 22 years old in Bangladesh has been till now as the glasses through which I have spent my life seeing, looking at, considering the terrible situation of which I decided to be the witness. So I am back today. A little later, 50 years later, as young as I was in my mind and in my strengths, I am back today at the very place where it started, in the very place where my experience of a writer, of a philosopher, of a cineast started. What did I understand in Bangladesh in this time? And why has Bangladesh become this sort of glasses or screen, whatever you want to call it, between myself and the rest of the world? I discovered, if I try to make a quick summary, a quick uh, uh, resume of what the footprint of Bangladesh in myself. I would say the following. Number one, I understood that you may say, of course, plus jamais ça. You may say never again, but alas, it always comes again. I remember my visit to Indaka at the end of December 1971 in the in the in R A Bazaar, where there was the worst chambers of torture of the Pakistani army. I remember the testimonies at this time of the survivors of the bazaar and of these torture. And I was, I was not even a young man, I was still a child in a way. But I understood that it will, this will, the thing will, the fascism will, if we don't oppose to him a strong barricade of will and world and commitment, come on and on. We cannot say it will never happen again. The brutality which I discovered of the Pakistani army, the killing fields around Jessor and Morthaus around Kulna were the proof of this terrible savagery which is in the heart probably of mankind and which can only be opposed by the laws, the institution, or the bravery of people. I understood the second thing about bravery precisely. Those who know, those in the West who pay attention to the history of uh, Bangladesh, um, have, are all, all of them, all of them are convinced that Bangladesh was liberated by the Indian army, which is true, of course. At the end of this terrible war against the civilians, after eight months of bloodbath, after eight months of raping, rapes, the Prime Minister of India of this time, who was a great lady, India, in this time was a great country, decided to end 
the story. But it was not only India. The souvenir I have is that this final victory, this liberation of the land, this defeat of what was considered by the rest of the world as a powerful army was due also to the people of Bangladesh itself. I remember, I remember, for example, in Gohala, Gohala, which is a, a city east of Jessore, when I spent a few days, I remember how the Mukti Baini were already so strong, so well organized, so disciplined, good warriors, that the Pakistanis remained hidden, protected, buried in their own barracks in Gohala. I remember another city called Besantar, close to Gohala where more than that, the Pakistanis were repelled, were defeated by the Mukti Bahini. What I was witness was that a, a popular uprising, a popular army, when she is uh, inhabited, by real values is stronger than an army who does not know why she fights and who is more or less aware that she is this bad army who, who fighting for dictators 2,700 kilometers away. I really discovered this valiancy and from October to, to November, from my first entry in Bangladesh in Satkira, where the Pakistanis were still there, the Pakistanis still held the border between India and East Pakistan. And I could only enter at this time, October, uh, by smuggling myself with a uh, father of family who went back to take his family. Between this moment and a few weeks after, it was night and day. Mukti Baini had constituted themselves as a force. The Pakistanis had left the custom points, the checkpoints, at the border of India. And one could already guess November, begin, beginning of December, that they could prevail. By the way, when you consider, and when you were witness, as I had in my mind some uh, philosophy, uh, some the great man, was the English writer, Lord Byron, Lord Byron, who decided to us on the capitulation act of the Pakistani army. It was a strange uh, event. The capitulation of Dhaka, the day of the capitulation, December 16 or 17, 16, 16. the Pakistanis in Dhaka were much stronger than the Indians. They were much stronger in number. I don't have the figures, but there was probably five or six times more Pakistani soldiers inside Dhaka than uh, Indian soldiers under the order of General Aurora surrounding the city. But the Pakistanis signed the Capitulation Act. Why? One could say that uh, uh, the Indian army was a fresh one at offensive. There has been a theory which is not false that the Indian general Jacob, who was by the way a Jewish general, who made the, one of the most incredible bluffs of the history of strategy 
He made the Pakistanis believe that the Indians were much more numerous and so on. There are many theories about the capitulation of the Pakistanis. I think that one element is crucial. The Pakistanis knew because they had made the experience of it that on the ground, on the battlefield, the Mukti Baini were the strongest. They knew that even if, I don't know, if they repelled the Indians, and at this time, the last days, I entered into Dhaka with the unity of non-fighters in India, by a, through a city called Srinagar, who were building roads, who were building roads, uh, avoiding the roads where, where you had mines. You know, there were the big roads who had been mined by the Pakistanis, and they were making, tracing other um, 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 supplementary roads. And at, the end, at this moment, it was difficult to know who will win this battle, Pakistanis, India. What I knew, and what probably the Pakistani knew, was one element, the force, the strength of the Bangladeshi people. The strength of these brigades of civilians who, had, who were coming from a culture, a pacifist culture. The Bangladesh people is not a people of warriors. I have this memory so clear in my mind. So many young men these years telling me how they were compelled to take arms, how they were not built for that, how they were not trained for that. They were obliged to defend their land, to defend their family, like the father who, whom I escorted to Sankira to take his children back. He was already in Calcutta. He came and fetched his family. So these people, who was not a peop your people, who was not people of war, who had, not a, who had a culture of uh, poetry, of art, of great songs, of uh, a great uh, of philosophy, has been compelled to fight. But when these sort of people <laughs> act this way, I discovered that he, he is invulnerable. When a people who is not made to make war has to make it and decides to act as such, he has a strength coming from where? I don't know. Maybe from its culture. Maybe from the ancestral culture. Maybe from the necessity to survive. But a strength which cannot be defeated. I really discovered that at this time. And for me, the real reason of the reddition, of the capitulation of the Pakistanis is that they knew it. They knew nothing about Bangladesh. It was like a colony for them, a colony. But they had made the experience of this on the battlefield, in Jessore, in Kulna, in Gohala, in Srinagar, in Chittagong, uh, they had made this experience. About Chittagong, I have little parenthesis. I have another souvenir of Bangladesh. At this time, I was a young uh, leftist. I'm still a leftist, but I was an extreme leftist, let's say. Bangladesh, for an extreme leftist coming from France, had a very strange particularity, peculiarity. Not only Bangladesh, the two Bengals, the Indian Bengal and the Bengal of Bangladesh, had a strange peculiarity for um, an extreme leftist, for a Maoist, as I was, it was the place in the world, like a sort of ecosystem. You know, sometimes you have a, a place where you have uh, very special birds or very special plants. In Bengal, you had the biggest 
de, de, de more large variety of communist and extreme communist groups. You have the group of Abdul Motin, you have the group of uh, Abdul Haq, you have the group of Mohammed Toha, and so, so many Maxalites, uh, whatever you call them. And for me, at this time, it was, I did not know yet that communism and, and extreme communism was the road to, was one of the road and maybe one of the worst, roads to slavery. I still thought that it was a road to freedom. And I saw these party, this dust of parties. And for me, it was another sign that I was devoting some time, that I was maybe sometimes risking a little of my life for people who was in love with liberty. I met one of them, Mohamed Toha. I went to see him, I interviewed him in a uh, village uh, in the area of Chittagong. I went there in very uh, Romanesque and complicated circumstances with a uh, humanitarian uh, uh, helicopter. I began to understand, by the way, when I saw him, that com extreme communism could be the road to the worst because he was a French guy. But Bangladesh was this place where you had some, a lot of young people, maybe by mistake, certainly by mistake like me, had the sincere will and wish and hope of building a new and a free world. Number four, I discovered, I think for me, it was my first experience, what is the birth of a nation? And what is a nation? It is not frequent in the history of the world, the experience, to live the experience of a nation nation taking birth. Generally, it is a long process. And generally, when it, when it happens, it is a failed process. We have a lot of failed nations and a lot of failed states in the world, even in the world of today, and especially in the world of today. I would not like to offend anyone, but uh, Iraq, Syria of Bashar al-Assad, even Lebanon in bankruptcy, you have fa failed states. I had the experience in Bangladesh during these crucial weeks when I was there, as I will be later with the Peshmerga and so on, of the building of a successful state. And this is an experience which is un forgettable. And what is a successful state? What is a nation built with success? What is a nation? It is what I thought in the depth of myself, but I had suddenly the laboratory proof, it is a common will. Of course it is a culture. Of course it is a land. Of course it is um, a common memory. But what I had the chance to experience after that, in 72, in the month I spent here after the liberation, is that the most important element, the most solid brick, the brick, the stone, which makes a nation built and a nation and a successful nation is the common will. We have a great writer in France called Ernest Renan, who wrote a very famous text in our country called What is a nation? And he said, a nation is an, un plébiscite de chaque jour, um, a, an everyday referendum. This is what I 
I felt what I touched, what I lived live, live, as they say on CNN, live in Bangladesh. Every day, the nation was found, founded, be, uh, 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 decreed, and the day, next day, same. In the family where I stayed, of my friend Rafikul Hussein, and then in the other family I stayed a few weeks after, there was an every day, and by the way, he's the brother of, of uh, Rafik must be here. He's here? No? Ah, oh, I'm sorry, okay. That, yeah, you are here, okay. Uh, it is an every day. In, 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 my, in this family, I was about to say my family. In this family, when I was considered as the son of the family, there was an every day vote, and everybody poll and vote for the nation. I understood that. I discovered that. I made the experience of that. And Bangladesh may have all the possible difficulties of a nation. Bangladesh can be in crisis. Bangladesh can face some uh, uh, big aggression, aggressions from inside. Hopefully not from outside, there is this solid rock, which is the common will to be a nation which remains and opposes to the bad forces. And, and I met a great man. I have met in my life a few great men. And in particular, I met, I had the chance and the honor to be trusted by some great man all uh, my life. Great man in my, in my country, maybe sometimes a president or a great writer, some chief of state in other countries too, and some great men or great political leaders in the Muslim world. I had a very special relationship for example, with Mr. Alia Izetbegovic, president of Bosnia-Herzegovina during the siege of Sarajevo. We had a very special bond. I had a special bond in Afghanistan with the uh, commander Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was a great man also and who I hope gave me uh, very little bit of um, camaraderie and um, and friendship. Uh, in Libya, I had I I made the experience of a sort of brotherhood with some Arab leaders of Libya who trusted me and I trusted them. Same in uh, other countries, but. The first one. And the first, my first Muslim brother, the great brother, brother for me, he was one of the men I admired most in my life. The first one for me was Sheikh Mujib Mohammed. Before Aliyah Yedrilovich, before Commander Massoud before President François Mitterrand, before President Shimon Peres in Israel, in this same sort of family of great leaders, at the same time wise and strong, able to make a war and to win it, though they don't like it, was Moudi Mohamed. And for me, he is a model forever. I admire probably no category of men or women as much as those who hate war, who consider that war is the worst experience that can happen to mankind, that far from alleviating the, the men, making them stronger and higher, contrary, it depreciates mankind. But that sometimes it has to be done nevertheless. The first I met who thought that 
that war was the worst experience, that it brings nothing to humanity, that it is not a school of, of a brotherhood or of greatness, but that sometimes it has to be done and who then win it was Sheikh Mujib Mohammed. And for me, my encounter with him is an unforgettable experience. Memory, not for only for myself, for my generation, of this um, part of the French history which is great. There is a dark side of the French history. The France who to feel um, committed to these values, to prove to myself that I did not forget experience. He will be till the end of my my life, in my heart, in my mind, and in the pantheon of those who shaped me and whom I admire and revere most. This is what I met, this is what I made the experience of in Bangladesh. Now, what did I want to tell you at last? I wanted to tell you to finish Bangladesh despair. I told you a lot about the darkness of which I was the witness in this country and not yet about the hope. And I think that this country can be a co and is a country of hope. And if I am here tonight, it is probably more important than what I said for that, for this. To tell you what is, in my eyes, the hope, the hopeful future of this country. There is your economy. I know that Bangladesh is a poor country. But I know also that you are a country who refuses to be a country of slaves and slaves of the globalization. I know that when there was this terrible tragedy of the uh, plaza, plaza uh, Ramna Plaza, I know I was there, here, the emotion which was spread around the country. I know how from the bottom of the country to the head, there was the decision to change that and to stop being the last end of a dreadful chain uh, who would make of the, who would transform the Bangladeshi ladies into slaves of big Western company. And I know that you have this force, and someone yesterday night told me that there, there are some indications that in a world in crisis, panicking for a virus, Bangladesh is, has in his hands some chances which you are apparently ready to play, to put in the, on the table of the big theater of the world. And this, for me, is so important. It's the first thing. I'm sure that Bangladesh can be as other underdeveloped countries in the past. You have a few examples. Ethiopia, China, of course. You can be one of those countries who gain prosperity if you give yourselves and if the, the rest of the world helps you in that, the necessary and appropriate weapons. I know that you are also a country of great culture, a culture which is under threat, by the way. You are a country of writers, 
of poets, of intellectual fighters who are targeted by some crazy false believers of uh, groups affiliated to Al-Qaeda and who, and who tried to kill them and sometimes did it. Ahmed Tutul and, and others and bloggers and so on. But even that, even this experience for Bangladeshi writers to be on the front line, even this terrible idea that you can be killed in Bangladesh because you think is the sign of the importance of this thinking. It is not all countries at the end of the day where writers are targeted as such, where writers, poets, translators, publishing house directors are killed or threatened to be killed or compelled to exile like Taslim and Asin, just because they have in their mind a culture. It is a proof a contrario of the greatness of this Bangladeshi culture. A culture which is threatened is a culture which is strong. It's a culture which is threatening the bad demons, demons of totalitarianism, bigotry, intolerance, and so on. Number three, Bangladesh gives the world recently and still today gives the, to the entire world an example of humanity, compassion, and brotherhood. I'm thinking of what is happening in a place where I'm going to go with my friends day after tomorrow, which is the, the Rohingyas, Cox's uh, Bazaar. The fact that such a poor country as you still are extend this brotherly hand to a community of women and men who are victims of crimes against humanity, maybe even worse, is a source of hope. And two years ago, I wrote an article in the French press. I think it was reproduced, reprinted here. I could not help making the comparison between two ladies. On one side, a lady which I had for long considered as a great lady who had the Nobel Prize, by the way, because I was not the only one to think that she was great. And in a way, she is great, certainly. Oksan Suki, with another lady who does not have still yet, who does not have yet the Nobel Prize, but who might deserve it as, at least as much who is checked as enough. On one side, a lady who could not find the words to condemn this prosecution of the Rohingyas. A lady, whatever the reason, who could not find the words to express her solidarity. On the other side, the grand dame a great lady, maybe the real great lady of the area, the daughter of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who found the words, who did the acts, who committed the deeds, and who really did extend a brotherly hand, till now, to the Rohingya. And this, for me, is an incredible lesson of life. And of, sorry, and of humanity. A poor country extending a brotherly arm to poorer than, than, than himself 
that's the most moving thing you can see. America or France being solidar, okay, it's normal. We are so rich, we have the duty of, um, of helping and of devoting 0.1% uh, of our PID, European countries in general, to solidarity. A country like yours committing itself to this act of brotherhood that cost so much here, this is a real great image addressed to the future generation, and I hope I will find a way to address it. Even more, when you think that this country has been himself a victim of an act of genocide. I was speaking at lunch with Mofidul Hawk, the president, the director of the place where we are. And he called the what happened here a not a the forgotten genocide of our times. And I think he is right. There was a genocide. Um, all the criterion criteria of genocide are here, and this genocide is not recognized as such by the rest of the world. My goodness, if I was a Bangladeshi, and with a little part of my heart, I am Bangladeshi, my heart, it makes me mad to have been victim of such a barbarity and to see this barbarity unrecognized, this can put you into despair and to matter. This is as if the victims were killed twice. When the people have been killed and when the killing is denied, it is as if they were killed twice. The Jews know that. The Armenians know that. The Tutsis of Rwanda know that. For all this genocide, there is some revisionist, so-called historians, so some negationists, so-called historians, who deny the genocide. But at least the truth has been said. For the Holocaust, the Holocaust of the Jews, those who deny are a little sect of crazy and stupid people. For what happened in Rwanda, the world now is aware there is no conflict of thesis. It is well known by everyone that it is a genocide. Armenian genocide, they are fighting. Our Armenian brothers are fighting since more than a century to see the rest of the world recognizing what happened to their grandfathers. At least some countries, American parliament, for example, Senate, did recognize. What here? What here? Who, what is the country? What, what is the great, uh, powerful country who recognized the genocide of Bangladesh? We don't even know in France or in America how many victims. We don't even know if it, if it is 500,000, 1 million, 2 million, 3 million. Even the figures is not uh, clearly known. By the way, if Bangladesh has to enter in modernity, has to see its culture flourish, bloom, its economy develop, this problem has to be solved first. This problem of the recognition of the genocide has to be dealt with before everything. I'm absolutely sure of that. It is a complicated task. 
under the responsibility of the Bangladeshi people and authorities themselves, with the help of foreign forces. We can do the job together, but you have to be the start. This genocide has to be documented. We cannot remain one more decade not knowing clearly the figure. We cannot remain, and you cannot, I say we, we you cannot remain uh, another decade not knowing precisely the names. In the Holocaust, we had a sort of similar situation. The number was not so clear. The names were not, the list was not absolutely at the beginning, at the end of the war, and there was no graves because a lot of them went in ashes and flames. There was a duty of a work of memory, a work of mourning and memory, which consisted in making the list of the names, making the figure at one, uh, not uh, roughly, precisely, and those who don't have graves, to give them symbolical graves which is memorials. This is what has to be done. My, I think if you authorize me to say that, this is what should be done in Bangladesh. I really think that if this nation wants to be faithful to its own promises, to the spirit of Bangaban, of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, Bangabandu, if this nation wants to be faithful to its martyrs. It cannot remain with under its feet this black hole of memory. There is a huge call for witnesses, which has to be done probably, I don't know. This is what you are already starting, my dear friend, throughout the country. Everyone who has a member of his family who, had, who has been killed in the genocide has to document that the name has to be added in the sacred list of the martyrs. And to all of them who have the, the reason, uh, there was also the admiration for André Malraux himself, I replied to him. Uh, at this time, and st still now, that time is not, uh, is not a river. To fight for Greece, which was not his country, no graves, because they have been buried in common graves, a memorial has to be built in a way or in another. I wish with all my heart that there could be in Dhaka a commission, an international commission of historians under the authority of the Museum of the Memorial of Mr. Uh, my friend, Mr. Hope, uh, inviting some historians, of, some sp specialists of genocide from all over the world, Armenians, Tutsi, Jewish, from the uh, Holocaust, whatever, working here with and, and under the authority of Bangladeshi historians under the authority of the authorities of the state and spending the necessary time, months, years if necessary, to make a stem out from the ground the living ghosts of the dead. If we don't give them a, a gr at least a symbolic grave, they will haunt us and you till the end of the times. And this is a scientific work. It costs a lot, a lot of effort and probably, probably of money. It can be done if Bangladesh takes the initiative and if uh, foreign countries give their help and solidarity. I told that there is a special bond between the country of Ambassador Shu and myself and yours. This could be an occasion, by the way, to give flesh to this bond. 
there is a very special relationship between it's not a I think it is not a secret between Sheikh Hasina and Mr. Macron. Special link, I mean, when they met, it was a real meeting. It was not just a diplomatic meeting. It, there was it, something happened during this meeting two years and a few months ago. A real encounter between two great leaders. France could probably, with all the experience we have at the end of the day with these sort of matters, could help this war, could champion, could champion this work of memory. And last and not least, and then I finish and I, we will, I will uh, reply maybe to a few questions if you wish, I've been too long. Uh, last but not least, there is nowadays um, a real clash in the world, a clash of civilizations, not between the West and the rest of the world, of course not, not between uh, the Christian world and the Muslim world, thanks God not, and I'm the living proof of not. My, I, I spent all my life fighting shoulder to shoulder with Muslim people, fighting for them religion. No, there is a clash of civilization inside the world of Islam between the fundamentalists, terrorists, radicals on one side, and on the other side, the part of the Muslim world who believes in equality between women and men, who believe in democracy, and who believe in the respect of the others, who believe in the respect of other faith, and so on. Bangladesh is, for me, there is a lot of people, in, of Muslim people in the world who belong to the second category. And I am among those who really think that the radical Islam is a minority and that they will lose sooner or later. They are not Islam, they are a minority, they shout a lot, but they are weak. But on the good side of the uh, Muslim sun, on the good side of the Muslim sun, of Muslim moon, you have Bosnia, Sarajevo, you have uh, uh, Morocco, you have a lot of countries, but I see no other country than Bangladesh, you have the Kurdish people also, who embodies so well, so perfectly, even in the symbols, a woman at the head of the state, this idea that Islam not only can, but must, and is naturally due to match with democracy, modernity, secularism, equality of genders, and so on. And Bangladesh, I think, has a real, has a special, can, can have a special role in the world of tomorrow. If, if as I think, there is a real battle going on. There is a battle in the West, by the way, between the, fa the populist, fascist, uh, undemocratic rulers and the democratic and liberal rulers. This is another clash of civilization. In France, there is a clash of civilization between Mr. Macron and Mrs. Le Pen. It is a clash of civilization. There is a clash of civilization between those in Poland and in Hungary, who are faithful to the message of liberation against communism and Soviet Union, and those who go back, who want to go back to the, uh, uh, in the arms of Mr. Putin. So, but in the Muslim world, there is this battle of spirit between the radicals and the Democrats. Bangladesh can be at the vanguard has the capacity, has the moral authority of being at the vanguard of this battle. Bangladesh could, your prime minister could, I hope 
she, she will find sooner or later occasion to do it, could champion in all, in the highest institutions of the world, this great conception of a Muslim civilization extending a brotherly hand to the, to the rest of the world. And this is a special mission in the coming world which will be so so harsh and so brutal. This is what I wanted to tell you today, my friends, ladies and gentlemen, in this very special day, which I wanted to put under the umbrella and under the shadow of the great leader who would be 100 years old in these days, and under the umbrella and the shadow of this great country who will be 50 years, what a young lady or a young man who is Bangladesh in a few months. I thank you very much.